Uh, several years ago, a long time ago now, I gave this talk about women and the church. And I talked about how I had these kind of childhood experiences in the church that I had grown up with, um, where the women were in the basement and the men were upstairs. The basement was where the kitchen was and where the kids' programming was, and where they had those bazaars and different crafting circles. And then the men found themselves in the upper floor at board meetings, preaching and pastoring. And the talk received like a great response but later I learned that some were furious. How dare she speak about this egalitarian organization in a way that doesn't properly reflect our values? This would not be the last time that I would speak hard words about the church that I loved. And it wouldn't be the last time that I was criticized for it. Years later, I was once again warned by the kind of those sim similar voices that my capacity to garner favor with the crowds would require me to lower my voice on issues of injustice and social ills. The subtle reminder that I should be silenced. It was in that moment, as I received that reprimand, that the word courage flashed across my mind. And it has stuck with me for years following as this persistent nudge. And while the word courage and the ideas of being courageous, a voice that speaks in the wilderness, seems like it should be something that garners some kind of reward, instead it is often a more difficult and sometimes lonely way forward. This feels specifically true within church circles and settings. As people share their stories of speaking up and speaking out, speaking up regarding the role of the church in the world, asking hard questions of leaders, pointing out faults in the institution, standing with those easily left behind, voicing new ideas and perspectives, and demanding a more hope-filled way forward. But for those who have the courage to do so, each one has equally found themselves labeled as controversial rather than as courageous. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to that from some vantage point or another. A time where you stood up, you used your voice, you spoke for something you deeply held as valuable, and rather than praise, you received that look of concern, a raised eyebrow of disdain. Courage and controversy sometimes go hand in hand. As we go through the Gospel of John, we're asking ourselves the question, Jesus who? as we strive to live out our value of Jesus-centeredness. Thus far, we have said that Jesus is God, that Jesus is active, that Jesus is light, and today we suggest that Jesus is courageous. Now, to be clear, I expect that along the way, through, as we go through this series, that some of my conclusions will leave you with questions, with thoughts that are different, with rebuttals, and we want you to write those down, and we want you to hold on to them. Um, and at the end of the series, Keith and I are going to sit down, and we're going to take your questions and thoughts, and we're going to attempt to wrestle with them together. So, as Jesus enters Jerusalem in John chapter 5, he finds himself near this water source called the Pool of Bethesda. And the scene before him is crowds and crowds of those who are sick or disabled, the lame and the blind and the paralyzed, each of them coming to the spot believing that if they can only get into the water at the exact right moment when the winds are stirred and the earth shakes just right, then they will be healed. People from all different faiths and traditions would surround this space, holding on to their hope as they were looking for a miracle, a way out of their situation and a means to their liberation. And as Jesus observes, his, observes the crowds, his eyes settle on one man. We're not told if Jesus speaks to others, if he engages with others, if he heals others, but regardless of all that happened that day, John draws our attention to this single story. There was a man who has been lame for 38 years, and for many of those years, he's come to the pool of Bethesda, looking, seeking, and hoping that somehow he could find himself in the water at just the right moment. But others got there first, the crowds rushing and leaving him to the side, uncared for, unhealed, and unliberated. But in an elaborate demonstration of the message of the kingdom of God come to life, Jesus wonders aloud, 
Would you like to be healed? And the man laments all of the reasons, all of the barriers, and all of the persons who have kept him from finding his way to the water at just the right moment. And Jesus recognizes that he has both misunderstood the question and misunderstood who is standing before him. And as the last words leave his mouth, Jesus simply says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man is healed. Instantly, the miracle he's been waiting for arrives. He jumps up, carries his mat, and prepares to head home. This is a glorious picture of all things being made new, brought to life, as the lame man can now walk again. Now, you would imagine that this would be a moment of celebration. This would be a moment of worship. This would be a moment of proclamation, except today is the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, one does not simply carry their mat and walk down the road. The Sabbath is intended as rest, intended as the day to remember the gift of rest from work that God had given to his people. But Jesus seems to intentionally do or allow radical actions on the Sabbath. He seems unbothered by the formality of what it means to work versus what it means to rest. Yet the religious have spent a lifetime trying to uphold the law of the Sabbath. And they are most certainly bothered when others fail to do the same. When others unashamedly carry a mat. It is this scene of the one slain man walking with his resting mat in hand that leads the religious to stop, to point, to stare, and to confront. The law does not permit you to carry this on the Sabbath. No, normally their reaction would elicit some kind of compliance, but this man responds to his observers, the man who healed me told me to pick up my mat and walk. And if you read between the lines, it's clear. While others walked by him, around him, and over him, only one man stopped and healed him. Only one man transformed his present and his future. And when they discover that it was Jesus, was not only the one who healed him, but also did so on the Sabbath and told the man to pick up his mat, they are even less interested in the man's story of freedom but are now even more focused on the maintenance of the rules, the upholding of the law, the sustenance of how things are and how things should be. But Jesus and the religious ones were not speaking of, about, or around the same ideas. They were not concerned with the same outcomes. They were barely speaking the same language. They were not, as Wright puts it, working within the same time zones. Jesus' explanation was living in a different time zone. His father was at work, and it was important for him to be as well. The heart of it seems to be Jesus' belief that Israel's God was then and there in the process of launching the new creation. And somehow, this new creation was superseding the old one. Its timescale was taking precedence. God was healing the sorry, sick, old world. And though there might come a time for rest... At this moment, it was time for the work of the new creation to go forward. They were living in the old time zone, and they were angry with Jesus for it, as it were waking them up too soon. That battle still continues today. Today in the passage, we meet Jesus as a courageous liberator. When Jesus encounters the man who is lame, all of the conditions surrounding the situation indicate that Jesus should do nothing. Nothing except offer the proverbial thoughts and prayers simply because it's the Sabbath. Not the most convenient day to suddenly move from not walking to walking. To perform the healing was to break the Sabbath. To move the man into the pool was to break the Sabbath. To heal the man and tell him to stand still was irresponsible and still would be considered breaking the law. But to not heal the man was to move against what God was unraveling in that moment and what God was revealing in that moment. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I think the question right there for us is, What is it that God is asking us 
to be courageous about? What is it that God is asking us to say yes to when we see what is unraveling around us, when we see what God is revealing in the moment? When I was speaking with a colleague of mine, and I, she had mentioned she had preached a very similar sermon from a different passage. And so I said, well, do you have any like, good stories that talk about you know, courage and controversy and the way they come together? And then she sent me this long list of names of like famous people who've done great things. She said, she said names of like civil rights leaders, activists, change makers, revolutionaries, and resistors. And it was a good reminder for me of all the different ways the pockets of the church have risen as courageous ones throughout history. One of the names that she mentioned was uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who despite the church's quick affinity to lean into Nazi idealism and nationalism, anti-Semitism and white supremacy, he chose to participate in the work of resistance and defiance rather than in the work of quiet assimilation. For this, he would be arrested, sentenced to a concentration camp, and would later be killed. She mentioned the name of Rosa Parks, who we know to be one who resisted the idea that she was less deserving or less human when she chose to take a seat at the front of the bus rather than moving to the back. Her small act sparked a movement of change. Then there are voices like Sister Simone Campbell, who is both controversial and courageous, a voice in the church and a voice to the government as she advocates voraciously for a more just world. There's stories about ones like John Wesley, who could find himself among the crowd of those who are the courageous ones, courageous enough to insist on the pursuit of liberation for the poor and for women and for those on the margins of society. There is B.T. Roberts, the founder of Free Methodism, who chose the enslaved and the powerless and the poor rather than the church that had formed him and sustained him. Each of these voices were reprimanded for their courage. Each of these voices were reprimanded because they chose to call the church and the society to wake up in what they deemed to be too soon and too early. Yet courage prevailed and courage sustained them. When I think about the modern church, courage is the word that I think we need more than anything. It's the very things our neighbors and our neighborhoods demand of us. Courageous churches that step into the lives and stories of individuals and communities and systems and whisper the promise of shalom, the promise that we will participate in the renewal of all things. We will participate in all things that were intended to become at creation. This is our small act of resistance. This is our small act of co-creation, our small act of peace, our small act of love. And so when we encounter injustice, the church, we are called to be the courageous ones. When we find ourselves face to face with pain and sorrow of another, the church, we are the ones called to be the courageous ones. When we hear the difficult stories within our communities and our cities and our world, the church is called to be the courageous ones. When we encounter a lack of love and compassion or goodness within ourselves or among us, even then, we are called to be the courageous ones. The ones who sit with those who long for a miracle. The ones who walk with those who want a way out of their situation. The ones who stand with those who long for a means of liberation. This is the calling of a church that is called to be courageous. Courageous liberators following in the footsteps of our courageous, liberating God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. We're going to sing a song. It says, it's a song that's called Great Things. And indeed, our God has done great things. And we, the church, are told that we will do even greater things. Courage calls us. Courage beckons us. Courage invites us to respond as ones who have experienced and are experiencing the power, the beauty, and the hope found when our lives connect with the message and the person who is our courageous liberator. Jesus is God. Jesus is active. Jesus is light. Jesus is our courageous liberator. May we go and do likewise. Let's stand together.